Goodness, that's got candy wampus. Oh, goodness. I wonder why it is that, yeah, you're like not even on the screen from the look of it. Yeah, I know. It got hit when I was getting something off the shelf. That's clear. Yeah, see, as I move this way, yeah. that moves that way. Let's see. So I need to move this around here. Yeah. To get That's me. Basically all I can do at the moment. Well, I'm trying to get. See, that's showing the closet and everything now, so I really don't want that. Let's see. Move that around. It's pretty close there. Angle it. Getting closer to, oops, a little too much. Okay. Hello, Harry. Let's see. What the heck? Oh. Let's see where we are now. Well, my head's out of the way. That's Pretty close. Can move it just a smidgey two more. Oh. Don't forget your sign. Well, right now I'm working on a little more than that. Uh, da -da -da -da. Okay, now I got to bring it down. A little more. I need power trim. <laughs> Wrong way. Not too bad. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, I was, uh, Eva asked me some questions and, uh, so I, uh, was, she has never been exposed to trigonometry that she can recall. She might've been, but that might be in the, uh, time where she was, um, That she lost with her amnesia. So it's one of those things where I was trying to show her some of the basics. Hey, David. Let's see. Now get this back down again. Get this rotated again. Oh, goodness, I really whacked it there. <laughs> hey, boss. Okay. That ought to be about right. Okay. Not too bad. Okay, so, yes, I did trigonometry, and uh, I hope I wasn't terribly boring. <laughs> uh, hello, Mr. Lodak. So, anyhow, get this wiped out. I didn't really have anything to put up on it today, so I didn't bother changing it. Oh. And uh, 
apparently Lars had a pretty good windstorm. Uh, but there was a, on the road out to uh, Lauren's place, uh, they had a, a family, uh, had their trailer burned down. And uh, luckily, um, yeah, apparently, as I understand it, there was a wife and a child staying there. And the husband is a truck driver. And he was not there at the time. But um, they also had a cat. And the woman was so worried about the cat, she didn't bother with anything else because she couldn't find the cat. So they basically lost everything that was in the trailer, plus some things that were outside. It was quite a uh, quite a, a loss for them. And uh, they're getting taken care of, you know, neighbors around here, people. People are good people, you know. It's a it's a community, not just a bunch of people who happen to live in the same geographic area. But anyhow, so that was kind of a, a fairly interesting thing. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, was out to the. Uh, um, uh, yeah, it was a it was a like a fifth wheel trailer or something. Um, the, uh, tried this trigger nom. Let's see. I'm, I'm, seems a little bit difficult to understand for me there. Um, there's a. YouTube channel called Trigger Anometry. Right? No, this is, I tried this. Oh, oh that's okay. <laughs> Trigger now. Okay, now I see what it is. It's a joke. I'm sorry, Pat. I'm a little bit slow at times. Trust me. Um, but anyhow, uh, let's see. Went out to the mill this morning. And the... Um, Leach pad, cover, everything was melted on that. So I got it siphoning and, and um, uh, it got it drained off. The um, pregnant pond above the precipitation cover was still mostly ice. Uh, there's a fair amount of water there on the north side because the building's on the south side. And so that's the side that gets uh, more sunlight. So I, when I was gone, I was letting it drain uh, using a siphon. The nice thing about setting up a siphon is that it doesn't take power and you don't have to worry about it. You just get it going and then leave when it, when it dries up. It's all done. And you just come back and, and can restart it again if you need to. The um, the support structure for the uh, conical ball, the, the agitation tank, is not quite um, wide enough to get 100% of the base of the tank on it. There's a little bit over, and that causes problems with the plastic base. So my plan is to take some scrap lumber out there and basically slightly increase the size of the base. It's 48 by 48 pallet, and it needs to be more like 50 by 50. So that's my evil plan. Uh, it'll take a few hours just, you know, scrounging up the wood and cutting it and screwing it all together. But relatively straightforward. I will not put the, or I'm not planning on putting the tank on it because we're going to uh, head out. What is the 11th, I think it is, something like that. Um, uh, we're 
we're supposed to get to Duluth by the morning of Saturday the 13th. So yeah, the 11th. So we're going to be leaving in less than a month. And the, uh, the temperature is going to be dropping drastically again here by the end of the week. So I wouldn't want to be doing anything out there that wasn't uh, highly stable, you know, where I can't just forget it and not worry about it. So um, what I'm going to do is just, you know, build that part. I might do a little bit of uh, pulverizing so that I'll have some good stuff for when I visit, uh, uh, what's his name, uh, uh, Jason and um, Rock Butcher. And on the way back, I'm going to visit uh, Dan in uh, South Dakota. It's the big city near Sturgis. I can't remember. You know, Twin something, I think it was. Um, and uh, so I will, uh, uh, that, that, gets me into South Dakota, which is by that time will be the last of the continental United States I have not actually physically been through. So that'll clean up my list. And, uh, um, but I, I say we don't want to leave anything risky before we take off. So I say may get a few things done, but nothing, I mean, I can't stand the agitation tank up if i'm not going to put water in it to hold it down and if i put water in it I have to be afraid of it freezing you know the outlet pipe and things like that so we'll just leave it as it is for the moment uh, i've got some other stuff to do um so that's that there got a few other stuff uh lauren's truck is I mean, he's making a heck of a bumper for, I'm not a bumper, a hitch for that thing. My goodness. If, uh, if that thing gets in a horrible wreck, the hitch will survive. Not sure about everything else, but the hitch will survive. That is well designed. Um, so I say that'll work well. Um, uh, Lars sent me some information this week, which may or may not be helpful. We'll have to test it. It has to do with uh, basically regenerating the resin. And uh, we'll see if it works. I, I checked and we did something similar, not, you know, last fall. And didn't seem to have a lot of effect, but there are significant differences between what we did and what we would do in a pure regeneration step. Yeah, because what we did was not as much for regeneration. Yeah, that wasn't what we were trying. Uh, actually, we were uh, to a certain extent. But anyhow, it's just one of those things that we shall see uh, whether the theory proves helpful or not. We shall see. Um, to, 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 no other um, real news here. Still working on the, uh, let me check my email, by the way. Uh, still working on the, um, <laughs> the jigsaw puzzle thing. And it's looking pretty interesting. And let's see. Let me check something here. Daniel. Uh, do, do, do. Okay. Uh, uh, let's see. That's from Dan. Okay, um, we did uh, try a little bit of 
testing in that we're trying to clean up some of the crystal clusters that we want to take with us. We're going to take some to Mrs. Wizard. And let's see, let me find a couple here. And see if Okay, so these are from top of the hill, and they're just kind of dirty and have quartz and stuff. We tried CLR, and what was that? Iron, iron off. Iron off. The one that seemed to do the best job of cleaning the crystals. This is with the iron off here. Let's see. It's kind of hard to see. They're pretty nice looking. And the, uh, the CLR didn't do as good a job. But, uh, yeah, the lighting sucks. <laughs> Anyhow, we're going to be taking some stuff with us and going to take taking some uh, um, some crushed ore and some chunks, you know, this sort of stuff, so that everyone can have a few samples of what we got. We're going to, um, with any luck, uh, Jason from Flower Girl Wizards and me. Um, We'll have time to do a little bit of sluicing of some crushed ore and see how well his, uh, his new riffle design works on that. Um, hopefully it'll work pretty well. Uh, well, that's about it. Uh, ben, we're, since we're going to be gone for a while, you know, we wanted to... Uh, put the minor bago and our cargo trailer someplace uh, more secure. So I've been spending a little bit of time getting everything kind of rearranged in the cargo trailer, which I've been using essentially as a storage shed for the last couple of years. We'll get that uh, mobilized here. So that's another little, little issue that's been keeping me busy. So that's basically it that I can think of. Um, hey, Jimmy. Uh, hey, Jimmy says he's got some work Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Thursday we're in Missoula. Friday and Saturday we can be there. Uh, probably, fr wait a minute, Thursday? Yeah, what, what day of the, the week is it? This is the 18th. Now. Oh, it is getting along there. Yeah, Thursday we have to take Eva to Missoula. I have a doctor's appointment. For a doctor's appointment. But um, we should be able to get out there Thursday night after that doctor's appointment. <laughs> hey, what are you saying, Lars? I'm, I'm slow on my lies. <laughs> um, well, what kind of job is it? What are what will we we be doing what kind of tools might I need to bring? Uh, so, yeah, that could that could be kind of cool. Anything I can do to get a little bit more cash, etc. Write this down. And remember, you've got a doctor's thing. Yeah, but that's on the 31st. That's a long time. But yeah, we can we can go straight from Missoula over to there. 
Um, well, we'll have to come back here first and get bugs. That's what I'm thinking, little one. Yeah. Uh, we'll have to get demolished siding and fascia. And haul it to the dump. Yeah, sounds like something we could uh, we could do okay. Um, not exactly sure what software means, but I'm figure we can figure it out. <laughs> Soft it. Okay. Yeah, basically, I I figure we go to my doctor's appointment, then we come straight back here. Yeah. And switch to bugs and go there. Yeah, we can get bugs all loaded up before we head out to uh, to Missoula, and then we'll just come back from Missoula basically switch vehicles and head on down to your place. We're going to probably be there probably about seven or eight in the evening. You're still selling, staying at the same place. Uh, correct, Jimmy. What leaching solution were you using, Brian? Okay, Jimmy, that's the plan then. Any problems, I'll give you a call. Any changes, you let me know. And we'll assume that you'll have all the tools we need except my basic hand tools that I have in the truck. Okay, sounds like a plan. Eco Gold X. So when you say acid washing, do you mean a thiourea? acid leach or something else i mean if you're using a thiourea acid stripping solution i understand and if you're just quote unquote acid washing that could mean other things so i'm i'm a little um uh, unsure hydrochloric plus nitric hmm let me know how it works. I've never never tried such a thing. Don't know how well it would work. Do you have any idea how loaded the resin was? Do you have any way of estimating that? Okay. And what is your plan on getting it out of the aqua regia? Sodium metabisulfite? Zinc? Uh, zinc's not going to work too well in aqua regia. It's just going to dissolve <laughs> rapidly and violently, in my opinion. And does anyone know something that I don't hear? But I, I'm, I'm pretty sure if you throw the zinc in there, it's just going to dissolve the zinc. And aqua regia... Unless you neutralize the... Op Aqua Regia first. Aqua Regia is nasty to work with and expensive. Yeah. Well, if you neutralize the thing, maybe. Hmm. Not, not a reaction that I'm generally familiar with. Lars uses that a bit. I know that he uses... But I, what do you use to, to uh, precipitate the gold again in your, in your uh, qualitative assay, Lars? Wasn't that sodium metabisulfate? I'm not sure. Yeah, say so it's a it's a chemistry I'm not familiar with in terms of any detail. I know that sodium metabisulfite 
can precipitate gold out of aquaregia. Okay, yeah. Stannous chloride. That's right, you're using stannous chloride. Hmm. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how it works. Because uh, I say it's, it's a chemistry I haven't, I've never attempted. When you, uh, um, when you've got the gold in the resin, uh, I'm not sure how well aqua regia can get it out. It's not like it's just dissolved. It's actually bonded to a certain amount. Now, I have a question about that. Uh -huh. Didn't you and Lauren do some reaction in in the lab in the winter when I wasn't there where you put some resin in aqua regia and you got a runaway reaction and had to take the thing outside? Okay, yeah. Well, first of all, I think he says he's using carbon here as opposed to resin. Yeah, we, we had a fun little run, thermal runaway with... Uh, um, uh, resin in aqua region. We tried that, <laughs> and it got kind of interesting. <laughs> Unfortunately, Patrick, they are. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, it's kind of frustrating, but be interesting. Uh. Oh, it wasn't a fire, uh, honey bunny, but it uh, it started uh, uh, reacting faster and faster and faster. We there's a video somewhere on that. I think we did. I think you it was had on a one of the clip in one of your videos about runaway reactions. Yeah, and that was when you put resin in aqua regia to see if you could get it to elute. Yeah, we got. Uh, we put it in a, uh, a secondary containment and added a little water and then took it outside. Uh, I was pretty cold outside at the time, honey bunny, so we figured that would work out pretty good. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's funny because we were just watching it effervesce. And it was effervescing faster and faster and faster. As like, luckily we were paying close enough attention. That's like, ah, things are getting a little radical here. Secondary containment. It's still getting radical. Let's get it out of here. <laughs> yeah, kind of, kind yeah, of ours. You were, you were getting those, those, those clouds of orange fumes and shit. We were getting orange fumes to the night, <laughs> the nitrate, uh, not nitrate. Uh, yeah, because they are nitrates. But yeah. yeah, the it was it, I was nitrous. I was not there, but yes, I remember you showing <laughs> me the video and fixing it. Yep, it was uh, it was kind of funny. But yeah, we were hoping that the uh, uh, aqua regia would recover the gold out of the uh, um, resin pretty well. It didn't. Uh, uh, you might also try the, uh, if the uh, aqua regia system doesn't work, you might try going to uh, the acid thiourea stripping stuff like we're using it. You could use it on the carbon and see what happens. So, yeah, I say it's, uh, it's getting it back into solution that may or may not be problematic. I don't know. I know that in the resin, it didn't work. Yeah. Um, we, we just ran into a bunch of different issues trying to get it out of the resin. <laughs> that was less than ideal. But we finally figured out something that worked. Um, yeah, the... Uh, this next setup 
getting the uh, the mill going and everything. That's going to take me probably several days of work to uh, uh, get that all set up. Because I said I think I'm going to be setting up my impact mill out there, and then probably a scaffold or something. And say so it's just going to be one of those deals. The thiourea has done a pretty good job on the stripping. Yeah, it would, Brian. The other possibility is if you were using the um, hydrochloric and nitric to strip it and you can plate it, you might run it through a, uh, an electrolytic cell and recycle your your solvent, uh, assuming that the electrical potential will keep it from redissolving off the cathode while it's doing its thing. Um, I would think it should. So that's another possibility too. That's basically what we're doing in our stripping circuit. So we're using the acid and thiourea to liberate the gold and then it goes from there directly to the plating cell and then is recycled back to the stripping. So it's, it's the same solution, but uh, um, that's what we're doing. I know when we were, when I worked at uh, ChemGold, that's what we did with, uh, it was a cyanide and sodium hydroxide solution, very hot, you know. Um, almost 200 degrees Fahrenheit, um, 2% sodium hydroxide, 2% sodium cyanide. Um, nasty, nasty stuff. And again, you, you run it through the, um, the carbon. That's what we do. We ran through the carbon, through the electrolytic cell, and then back to the carbon and just keep circulating it that way. That was the thing. But it'll be interesting to see how that works. I'm, I'm curious to see. And the other question, Brian, is do you regenerate your carbon? Is it, is it now ready to reuse? In the case of ChemGold, the carbon continued to be reused for quite a while. I mean, I'm thinking six to 12 months before it eventually got poisoned to the point where it wouldn't work. The resin system that we're using, currently we have not found an effective way of regenerating the resin to anywhere near original uh, reactivity. You know, So we do get some uh, ability to recover gold again, but it's only like, what was it, a third or a quarter of what it is fresh out of the, you know, fresh from the factory which doesn't make it worthwhile. We, we saved all our old resin, so if we come up with something, we can get it fixing, you know. So that is our evil, you know, that, that's our evil methodology. It'll be interesting to see how yours, yours works. It's interesting to see how many different people come up with different possible ways and uh, and go from there. Yeah, well, our, our system is not a dirty mess. I, I will give it that. It seems to be pretty effective. I would say it should be in pretty good shape after about 24 hours, although we are, we are getting indications that if you take the uh, resin and let it soak some more in the thiourea, it seems to liberate more gold out of it. So we're going to be doing some experiments there. Hey, Jean-Francois. Um, so we're, we're going to be doing some experiments there to see whether the stuff that we think is pretty well stripped may actually be able to be 
you know, it's it's got some stuff like very deep in the resin. And uh, so we'll see what happens there. Um, but it's uh, uh, we're we're far from I don't know what you're going experts at this point. <laughs> uh, we're having uh, we're having fun learning. Now carbon has issues, you know. Uh, dusting is one of them. The resin doesn't really dust. It comes in a particular particle size and pretty much stays in that particular particle size. Whereas uh, carbon abrades during uh, handling and such and does create dust. And then you lose the dust and then you've lost the gold that's in the dust. So that's... Uh, uh, another issue that needs to be considered when before we ever um, put the carbon in circuit, we would soak it and wash it with fresh water for quite a bit so that it could agitate and, and kind of polish itself a little bit. And that um, did a good job of minimizing uh, losses. It's the first time you start running that stuff. Yeah, you get a lot of dust in the wash water. Well, the, the carbon we were using, well, I think 1224 coconut shell carbon, which means the largest particles were 12 mesh. The smallest particles were 24 mesh. And it was activated coconut shell carbon. Came in, you know, the big forkliftable bags, those sort of things. And it was not washed. I mean, once it was manufactured and crushed, that was it. It was just loaded dry in there. So there was, there was a lot of dust still sticking to it and such. And there's also going to be a certain number of sharp, thin edges and stuff that'll break off as you start using it. We were using fluidized bed columns, uh, which basically were like this. Column one, we had a false bottom with a fine screen in it. And that was your inlet. And then, actually, we had a launder here. This is not a cap. It was only it was just a perimeter cylinder that's attached here. So as this overflowed, it would go into this, which is called a launder, to an outlet, and then to the next tank. Like that. And those tanks held, I think, a thousand pounds of dry carbon, but I don't recall for sure. It's been a little while. There may be people watching who are who are younger than when I did that. Uh huh. Uh, so, yeah, you don't have to worry about Eva when it comes to that, honey bunny. So, anyhow, that's basically what we did. And, yeah, when you first put carbon in one of those columns, we had to wash it with fresh water for quite a bit just to make sure that we got all that dust out of the way. So, I'd say that that was what we did there. Uh, vastly larger scale than what we're doing <laughs> right now with just the uh, 300 to 350 gram resin loads per cartridge. I say that was, I think it was 1,000 pounds of carbon. I don't know, but we, we got 3,000 ounces a month. What? Three cartridges is one kilo. 
two cartridges not when of I load 333 them. and one of three. I put 350 in there, little Which one. is why I load them now. <laughs> because you were messing up my map. Nope. I can do 350 times integers. No problem. But anyhow. Um, hey, Red Wing. So the I, I was not involved in the mill. I helped out very occasionally. I, I was heavy construction, exploration, and mining, and building the heaps on the leech pads, building the leech pads themselves. But as soon as we started uh, throwing cyanide uh, solution onto it, it was no longer my business, you know? And I got back to making more leech pile. So, say so that's... Uh, I, I wasn't that thoroughly knowledgeable about it. But uh, as I recall, does anyone happen to know what the loading factor of carbon generally is in terms of, uh, in, in the case of resin, it's supposed to be maximum loading of about 10% by weight. You know, so uh, theoretically... Each 333 gram cartridge should hold about a little over an ounce. In reality, other stuff is binding there and 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 using sites, etc. So we're only getting about a third of that. But we we should get about three percent loading factor is what we're observing in our uh, resin. I would imagine, but they're say this is some of it is also just the pure surface chemistry in terms of how many binding sites per gram are there, and that's why I was wondering on the uh, on the carbon in general, what's considered a good loading factor for carbon. It was my understanding, and I say I don't remember, but it seems to me that resin had generally higher loading factors. So anyhow, uh, that that's what we have a lot more experimenting to do, and uh, as high as ten percent. Okay, so roughly comparable then. If the jigsaw puzzle comes together, I don't know how what we're going to get accomplished on what this summer. We'll just be doing too much. We'll have so many different things to do. I'm sure it does, Jean-Francois. Carbon is not highly specific. Um, it was it was clear visually the difference between the uh, pure gold and the um, What's the other? 104133. What resin was that? Max water. You could tell by the color of the resin that the max water and the pure gold were absorbing different amounts of different things. They were a different color. You know? Okay, thank you, uh, honey bunny. But, uh, I say it's just one of those things. We're using a fairly small resin bead stuff. I mean, it's pretty, got pretty good surface area, but we still have lots of of testing to do to see what the what the parameters are with a, a high degree of confidence. And I say we still have to try and figure out a way to regenerate the resin figure out the exact loading factors, blah, 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 blah. You know, I say we got a lot of stuff to do there. And I say that's, <laughs> that'll probably take up, I say we, we just got too much stuff to do <laughs> as soon as the weather changes. So we shall see what we shall see. But yeah. 
it, it's going to be fun to get back to working for a while. Then it's going to get pretty tiring, I have a suspicion. <laughs> So, anyhow, um, that's, you know, what we're trying to, to accomplish, and uh, it's going to be interesting. You're in full, full meltdown mode? I presume what you mean is you're in the spring runoff melt <laughs> mode. <laughs> Uh, I, I think he's talking about the snow, Jean Francois, but I could be uh, could be wrong. Am I correct, Harry, or what? <laughs> Fourteen inches on Friday, and now the weather's heating up, huh? Wow, that'll do it. That will definitely do it. Yeah, that's a good question. How do you do that, Brian? How do you get the specificity? Yeah, Jean-Francois, that uh, that might be an issue. Hopefully you'll get a wet spring. Although, what would happen there? If you got a wet spring after a dry winter, would it just create a lot of understory that will then dry up later and, and just turn to tinder? <laughs> well, the gremlin high priestess of climate, Greta Thunberg, would say, of course, it's all man-made climate change. Uh, uh. Yeah, we're, we're probably a little bit low on the overall snowpack this winter, but I think it's fairly average, maybe a little bit light, not too bad. I say, hopefully, um, once I get the trailer and truck moved out to the storage area there, um, it can it can rain pretty good while we're away and in April, and then I won't feel bad because there's not much we could have done anyhow. <laughs> well, uh, I agree, Brian, but I mean, what is a selective leach? You know, if you've got iron and such, almost all of these are going to have iron, so you, do, you don't want to dissolve iron if you can avoid it. And uh, how selective is the eco gold x i don't i don't know i mean i it'd be nice if i had a detailed chemistry of exactly what i'm using it would be nice if we had detailed multi-element analysis at every step yeah it would be nice <laughs> if we were <laughs> extraction chemists too extraction metallurgist chemists i say we're uh unfortunately not as uh theoretically uh knowledgeable as would be <laughs> ideal um, I'd like to get some of that rectified next winter if we could little one see if we could take some kind of chemistry and geology and mineralogy stuff or whatever that would be cool again it depends there's this winter it was kind of nothing to do Next winter may be busier than hell. Uh, absolutely, Jean-Francois. If you want to pay for it, I'll be happy to do it. <laughs> you know? Uh, Bunny says that ammonium hydroxide will quite selectively dissolve only three elements, gold, silver, and copper. Currently, we're operating in a test mode, and we're trying to evaluate. I have a uh, an inquiry in to the DEQ 
to see exactly what environmental regulations apply under what circumstances. So assuming that they respond to me, they haven't yet, I just checked the email. I should have a better, more comprehensive answer to that question in the not too distant future here. Yeah, that, that's kind of the uh, the idea, right? Um, that they seem to do that. And these things kind of come in waves, too. Uh, during the last administration, regulation was uh, not nearly so much emphasized as it is in this administration. Um and we shall see what we shall see, depending upon who you talk to. Um, the individuals they're dealing with can be anywhere from fairly reasonable to a real pain in the butt. So I'm not sure. I'm afraid that there's more truth to that than there uh, there was in the past right now, Jean-Francois. The only thing we can say about that is that it, it literally cannot last. So, you know, if you're trying to crash a system, eventually it'll crash. And then you get into a, a new regime in terms of a, a new environment, a new a physical state or whatever that has different rules and we'll we'll have to see after the transition what we have again it's my feeling that we'll, we'll see a transition of some kind in less than 12 months we shall see but that's uh, that's kind of my thought and so that also makes it rather frustrating to uh, predict what you should do. Well, and whether or not things go according to plan, honey bunny. You know, the, uh, the plan... Vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ukraine and Russia seems to have gone a bit sideways. So, I say, what, I don't know what their plan is, whoever's doing what. I don't think it's a good thing, but I also don't think it's going to go the way they plan. <laughs> so then it gets really unpredictable which is very frustrating when you'd like to be able to have a predictable environment in which to accomplish things so you know what you can do, what you can't do, what processes will function in that environment and like that. That's where thing is. And I, I don't like... Uh, I don't like having to factor in a lot of uncertainty so because that slows you down you can't go for broke sort of thing whatever you have to build in excessive cushion everywhere and that's going to slow you down you know and um that's an issue we got some pretty complex rocks around here, Jean Francois. We could just try mixing them all together, throwing some eco gold X on them, and see what it dissolves. So that's that's my thought, because natural rock is more complex than a mixture of of metals, 
and you don't find metallic substances except for gold very often in natural rocks anyhow you're looking at compounds you know different kinds of minerals and compounds you know you got you know uh you know, silver is rarely native silver it's usually silver sulfate sulfates or silver chloride or silver this or silver that you know so the chemistry becomes more difficult what would or would not work on say steel is perhaps radically different than what works on magnetite you know so these are the sort of things that by just mixing a bunch of rock together um you should be able to uh, uh get a lot of opportunities for things to dissolve and then just analyze the solution but let's say to, to analyze the solution will run a hundred bucks or more if you want everything um doesn't well <laughs> assuming the guy's equipment doesn't break down like last time uh so that's well, I know exactly how I'd love to test if we had the money to do lab things. Yeah. Another thing is, is doing general testing is fine, but it still doesn't tell you specifically about your ore. And therefore, testing a particular ore sample is perhaps more efficient way to do that and then you just get more and more ore samples over time and so i say these are the sort of things that you know uh, we never seem to run out of things that could be done and it tends to become a priority either due to time physical constraints like winter or uh, financial constraints there's a, a never-ending number of things that we could try. Hello, Shane. How's it going? So these are the sort of things. I uh, don't recall seeing your name before, Shane. If you have any questions or whatever, any subjects in terms of gold mining you like covered, uh, please ask. Uh, as people can tell you, last week we had somebody ask a couple questions, and it worked really, really well. We had a nice wow. thorough discussion about general extractive metallurgy theory. You know. So I say it's uh it's just one of those things where I'd love to spend a lot of time testing a lot of things. I'd love to have a really nice lab with which to test it. And uh, <laughs> I would like to have a substantial budget with which to do the testing. Uh, oh, here's some. We, uh, we explored the possibility of doing a LIDAR study around top of the hill. And it, as I recall, the gentleman gave me a rough estimate of about $1,000 if it could be done in a day. Well, when I gave him the actual location and this and that and the other, it turns out that the, it comes out to more like $10,000 a day. And... Um, it's roughly a half a mile, half a square mile per day is what they can do. Okay. Um, it's, it's one of the things that, uh, definitely puts it out of reach. You know, it ain't going to happen. Not for that kind of price. Now we find a, really big mine that's making piles and piles and piles of money, eh, that might change.
So I say that's uh, that's kind of the upshot of what the uh, lidar study research indicated. It's uh, it's fairly pricey, so probably not going to be able to do it. Got lots of things to do up there if we got the time, and none of this takes into account Jeff Kablock showing up this spring, which he's scheduled to do, and wanting to maybe work something out with one of his minds. <laughs> so, as I say, I anticipate a very eventful summer and fall, and that would be without any external complications, which I fully anticipate there will be. <laughs> but uh, I also got to get that engine on the truck running properly. I'm pretty sure I need to rebuild that carburetor because the, uh, the driver's side idle circuit doesn't seem to be working. Put the screw all the way in, pull the screw out four or five turns, no real difference. Okay. So I'm pretty sure I got a plug in there. Haven't had time much to worry about it. And when we get back, well, it depends. If Lauren has time, we might go on over and, and uh, see if we can rebuild that over at his shop. However, I fully anticipate he's going to be really busy. So I may just have to buy a rebuilt carburetor. First thing I'll do is just try sticking an air hose in there and, and blowing the dirt back up in the carburetor, you know, up in the float bowl. <laughs> so anyhow... That's about it. Uh, I talked to Chris last week. He's doing okay. You know, uh, his internet access sucks. So that's going to be an issue until he gets that taken care of. I still have some samples that I have to crush and pan. Yep. Are you using more of a conventional panning technique or like my technique or both? I would recommend both because they work on different size gold. But uh, not just yet, uh, Jean-Francois. I've got it. I moved it over to a, a file. Should be should be in the where is that resume? I think that was the file. No, okay, so it's going to be probably in that file. Yep, there it is. I've got I've got them right there. That's <laughs> weird. That's got to be from from uh, Outlook. Maersk <laughs> freight. Yeah, sure. Uh, oh, yeah. I said, I'd love to try stuff. I've just been, well, distracted, busy, and a little bit, I don't know, tired, I guess. You know. If I, if I can't get up there and really get going on something, I tend to like, eh, yeah, yeah, what the heck, man. Yeah, I say, I've, I've got it saved, Jean-Francois. Um, let me write it down here. Oh, what else we got here? Where is my pins? I've got a bunch of them, but uh, let me put it down here. My mind's going a million miles a minute, mainly in circles. 
So if I don't put something on my on a list to where I <laughs> see it from time to time, I tend to forget about it until it's like, oh crap, I wanted to look at that. You know. But yeah, I say I, I must admit to being distracted by the external circumstances and the fact that there's not much I can actually do right now. Very, very frustrating. Have to be careful about money. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. I've got lots of things to do and nothing to do them with, you know, which is rather annoying. Oh, so such is life. That's a good question, Jean Francois. Um. You know, there's there's no reason I couldn't ship you some more. You know, I can I can crush some up and ship it out to you, so you could test it if you're set up to do that kind of stuff. Say I I'd have to order in chemicals and things like that, and then justify it. And it's very frustrating when you don't have a a really good place to work. Very very annoying. I don't know, Jean-Francois. I say, but I, I'm sure that uh, I could, you know, how much crushed ore do you want? Because I got tons and tons of ore sitting over here. It wouldn't take long. Hmm. <laughs> okay, Jean-Francois, let me think. Well, let me let me look at those and I'll see. I've got all the equipment. Um, possibility you could ship me the chemicals. You know, you could buy the chemicals and have them shipped to me. And then I could run some tests over here. What do you think of that idea? Because that should be fairly simple to accomplish. Just order the chemicals online and have them delivered over here. Okay. We should be able to do that. Let me look at it a little bit. And uh, we can discuss it through email. And uh, we, we can go from there. Because that's, I mean, I don't know what all the different chemicals are and the systems, etc. But yeah, send me a uh, an email uh, just to kind of remind me, and then I'll look it up, you know, see the things, and then respond and say, uh, um. Oh. Um, and, and then we can, as I say, discuss it in detail, but I don't see any reason why I couldn't do that, you know, but let me check it out and make sure so I know exactly what it is I need to do. I'm not sure what all the parameters are, but if it's going to be something you can use in a leaching system, it's going to have to be fairly straightforward. And then say you could, you could pay for the analysis of the solutions and we could get uh, uh, get some stuff going there. Yeah, either have I. Let, let me take a look at it a little bit. But I'm sure I've got somebody in that general direction over there that would probably find that interesting. Right? Oh, a long-haired lass. Don't think she's listening. I'm listening. Well, a question was asked upon you. Well, I'll ask again. Okay. Um, he wants to, we're discussing the possibility and uh, of doing the glycine testing uh, on our ore here. Oh. 
and uh, him kind of paying for all the. Uh, Does it mean I get to do lab shit? Yes, that's exactly. And I get what to it. find out cool shit. Well, we we would hope to find out cool shit. It's well, basically obviously, anything that involves the goddess getting to find out new things is highly desirable. Well, then you shouldn't have been paying attention. But anyhow, so yeah, I think I got someone over there that's interested. Oh yeah. <laughs> and uh, as I say we can work work out the details through emails or, or phone. I want to test many things. So I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss the details and go from there. But, uh, yeah, it never hurts to have another uh, tool in the toolbox. Uh, do you want me to copy a link or anything, Jean-Francois? Brian Smith is curious about this. And uh, um, if you want me to uh, copy a link, or you can you can just post the links again. I think you put a link. Let's see. Is it easier for me? You cannot post a link. Okay. Let me go here. Let me go here. Uh, where are we? Okay, there we go. Uh, okay. Okay, so let me get the control C. Uh, control V. Okay, there is the link to the company's website, Brian, and uh, um, as I say, I haven't done any testing on it. Apparently, Jean-Francois has done some very limited testing and found it visually effective, but... Uh, I haven't looked at it, so I really have no uh, opinion one way or the other anyway on it. Okay, I'm, I'm just completely ignorant at this point. And uh, we'll have to see where it all goes. Little one, can you take over for a little bit, please? Well, I suppose so. Well, you better. Uh. Just don't take forever. I have to get ready for my report. Hi, everybody. It is beautiful weather out right now. We are having a sudden spring. There's like 60 degree days going on and everything. You have a freezing Friday. No. Ooh. Jean-Francois, Jean -Francois, that sounds good. And uh, we're supposed to be having snow on Thursday? Friday. Okay. Because Thursday I need to go to Missoula. Huh. Cool. Yeah, we'll have to make sure we're dressed warm for Cardwell. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Anyway, it's been beautiful up here. It, it's been really beautiful. Oh, and we are getting ready for the big road trip, which I'm really looking forward to. <laughs> anyway, he's coming back. We shall see. Uh.
Uh, yeah, it's amazing how many different chemistries appear to actually dissolve gold. You know, people think of it as inert, but it seems like there's a number of ways you can uh, make it uh, less than inert. So this is interesting. So I have a feeling a lot of the popularity of cyanide chemistry for gold extraction is if it's stable, relatively low cost, and works in relatively low concentrations. And um, thus, it was very economical. But uh, <laughs> it's a uh, <laughs> so let's say we shall see. I think there's there's going to be a lot of a lot of interest in this kind of. I really don't know, Brian. You'll have to go to that website, I guess, and uh, and see from there. So, I say that's that's interesting. We'll see what we can do, um, uh, Jean Francois. Because uh, yeah, it'd be good to get some other stuff. Take care, Jean Francois. And uh, anyhow, so looks like we'll be checking another chemistry out too. <laughs> We're also going to be testing different ways of, of trying to regenerate that resin. Again, once we get back to where we can do something. Because I got... Last summer, we spent a great deal of time um, in the field. Uh, less time at the lab and at the mill. Doing a variety of things. And... Now we've got, you know, towards the end of the season, we got quite a bit stockpiled. And so we've got something to work with now. We just don't have weather to work, <laughs> work with. And then the first couple of weeks of potentially useful weather in April there, uh, we're going to be out of town. So, you know, really, Brian. Well, let's see. There was something else he sent me. Hold on. And let me see. Uh, I know he sent me something that had some um, videos on it. Hmm. Let's see. Glycine leaching technology, Druxlova. Contact us. Uh, you might try the contact us thing. Well, glycine. Do you have a, uh, a video showing there on glycine leaching technology? I hate to click on it right now. Reduces cyanide, reduces, improves ESG footprint. Uh, do you see that uh, video link there? Hey, Rock, how's it going? Just home from Minneapolis, huh? <laughs> what did you do in Minneapolis? Yeah, Brian, look at that website. See if you see a link to a video. I mean, a, a video showing there. Okay. Shopping. I take it Thunder Bay is not the shopping, the center of the shopping universe of the frozen north. 
you know? Well, he does have a family, Bunny Bunny. <laughs> he has a wife who he describes as having a certain amount of uh, assertiveness. Yeah, let me know what you see from that, Brian. Uh, so, I mean, women shopping, I don't think I'd like to try and get between his wife and shopping if she wanted to go shopping. Um, am, am I correct, Rock? I suspect I wouldn't want to get between, between your wife and anything she was seriously wanting to do. <laughs> uh, I'm not much into shopping myself, honey bunny. I, I'm, I'm into buying. Something I need, I go to buy it. Um, I understand exactly. That's the way I am. Um, Eva's pretty much that way. Although she does like to just wander around a little bit and do a little bit of window shopping and this and that and the other from time to time. But it's not, not like your average woman. You know, uh, women, to, to most women, hunting is like shop, like, I mean, shopping is to women like hunting is to men. <laughs> you know? You're looking for the prey. Ah! A sale! You know, this sort of thing. But I think the psychology has a lot in, in common. Oh, well, that brings up an interesting point. I was watching a, a video, Tim Pool, and supposedly somebody did a study, and about half the people or more think differently than I do. And I mean, I'm not talking about opinions. I'm talking about processes. And I don't know about you, but my mind, I'm constantly got like a little chatterbox going in my head and I, I'm visualizing things. And when I think about stuff, I, et cetera, et cetera. And um, according to this information, about half the people don't. They don't have an internal monologue or dialogue. They don't do visualization. And it would seem to me that that would make the ability to analyze things extremely difficult. If you can't visualize, how can you set up a sequence or something? I mean, you know, say if you can't visualize, how can you analyze? And... Uh, <laughs> Excellent, Rock. How old is your daughter? Vectors and scales. Well, that sounds like at least high school, 16. Yeah. Yep. That would be about the age to do it. And uh, so I say, I was just wondering. And here, is there anyone, I, I suspect that the people who watch this channel all have an internal monologue or dialogue, you know, um, and are able to visualize. And I just, is there anyone listening, watching or whatever that doesn't have an internal monologue where you're, you're talking to yourself or things like that? <laughs> Um, I say my suspicion is no, we all do. And it would explain a lot if, if there's that much of the population that literally processes information in that much of a different manner, it would explain why people perceive the world radically differently. You know, and I, I haven't heard hardly any research on this. I mean, this is the only time I've ever heard anyone research because I thought everyone had the internal dialogue. Um, and I mean, you know, they, they talk about, you know, the chattering monkey in the back of your brain and stuff like that. The thought of a lot of people that don't is 
was completely alien to me until a few days ago. But, uh, yeah, I, uh, I would think that it would, you know, people like us who build things, design things and like that, it would seem almost magical to them. I, I don't know. So, well, the internal dialogue is nothing new, but the fact that, you know, if it is a fact that some people don't have an internal dialogue, that would be what's a new concept to me. I just, you know, let's say that's, well, well and not only that, yeah, especially in company rock. But it also would explain why certain people can say things that make no logical sense. Because in order to do a logical analysis of a concept, one has to be able to think sequentially, I would think. <laughs> I would think. <laughs> and if you can't think sequentially, all information essentially comes from nowhere. It just magically appears, supposedly. So once you've given someone a concept, this is the way things are, they just believe that. And it would be very difficult to refute it or change their position because when you start throwing counterexamples, they can't process that. You know? So that might be a good explanation. And I, th I think it would be really cool if somebody analyzed how these thought processes or lack of them affect people's viewpoint of the world in general. You know, for example, do people who don't use this method of thinking, are they more or less religious? Are they more liberal versus conservative, et cetera, et cetera? You know, it is a fascinating concept. I just never thought that it there was such a thing. Now, such a dichotomy. Um, and Eva brought up an interesting point. In the not-so-distant past, say 100 years ago, if you couldn't think analytically, if you couldn't think sequentially, uh, you didn't last too long. You know, you had to find a real simple niche, you know, to survive or else you were dead, you know. And nowadays, of course, you don't have those um, evolutionary pressures. Perhaps, honey bunny, say, I really don't know, but that's a, and say, to me, it's an interesting, yes, uh, housekeepers, things like that. It would, it would make sense. Back then, there was a lot of um, important labor that needed to be done as labor. You know, washing the dishes, cleaning the floors, slopping the hogs, all this stuff. And that might be a useful... Um, adaptation to that position. It would also explain why so many people don't seem to think about the future. Because they don't. It's like, don't you see where this is leading? Huh? You know? So, say, that's a, a very interesting... Uh, if, if anybody runs into any videos or information that addresses this question... I'd be interested to uh, to look at that because, say, it's just it's, it's a whole new concept to me. It, I never thought such a thing could actually happen, you know. But it would, I would imagine, it would radically transform how one perceived the world and interacted with the world. So, say, I just. Find it fascinating. Uh, <laughs> I, say, I, just, I don't think too many of us are in that category um, because 
you just couldn't do the kind of things we do without that kind of analytical thought. I would think perhaps I'm wrong. Perhaps it's more like idiot savant sort of thing. You know, where some people just know things and it works. I have a feeling it's more like some people know things and it doesn't work. So anyhow, that's just an interesting little tangent there. But if anyone's got runs into anything on that, I'd, I'd be very interested in seeing it. And uh, so that's that might explain a lot of things. I don't know. Um, and Rock, if you're still there, we are planning on leaving the 11th, which would be a Thursday. And that gives us two days to get to, um, oh, Duluth by Saturday morning. So everything looks good for a Saturday morning arrival in Duluth on the 13th of April. Uh, that's our evil plan. And I've got your phone number and you've got my phone number, so we should be able to coordinate well. And uh, so uh, looking forward to seeing you and your family, you know. But that's uh, that that appears to be pretty firm. Saturday the thirteenth, and then I'll have to talk to uh, Jason a little more detail and stuff. But then uh, Sunday the fourteenth with him, and then uh, the fifteenth I plan to try and do a uh, <laughs> a live stream from the road. We'll see how well that works out. If you don't hear from us. Don't worry. It just means the live streamy thingy didn't work out too well. Uh, um, it's not that bad as far as we can tell. You have to head to North Carolina on the 14th for the spring dirt fling at the Lucky Strike Mine. Boy, that sounds like fun, but we got to go. To, we got to go to Boston. Um, so do you have to, uh, let's see, are we planning to overnight at Duluth? Okay. Um, we would plan either on overnighting at Duluth or at Abrams, which is where, uh, that's about four hours down the road. You know, whichever. So, um, we'll be flexible. You know, um, we can do this, that, or the other. And that's the nice thing. Okay, let's see. Brian just got back. Glycine is a cyanide substitute that will not leach iron. It says to be used in a vat or heap leach. Glycine catalyst for gold works for gold there. Yeah, I say I, it, we'll work something out, Rock. Again, we we usually freeform these things more than a little bit when we're rolling, but uh, uh, we should be in Duluth, um, you know, by noon on Saturday. We might overnight close to Duluth or not quite so close. We'll see. Who the heck is Nick Lander, and why do you have something against him, Honey Bunny? Uh, and where the heck is an Owatona? <laughs> What's an Owatona? Oh, okay. Um, Jeff, he's talking about glycine, and... Here is the link to a company, and there's a, a video there. 
It's a, an alternative leaching chemistry, apparently. I haven't had a chance to look at it yet. So there's the, uh, um, the link that we're, we were discussing there. I haven't had a chance to look. There's a video on their homepage there. He apparently checked that out. They also have a contact us tab that I saw. Um, but uh, Jean-Francois uh, thinks it sounds like a potentially interesting alternative to uh, Eco Goldex as a non-toxic leaching stuff. Well, that doesn't sound very good, Honey Bunny, but if he's that easily mm, dishonorable, <laughs> you're probably best not not uh, associated in any way. I say that uh, if, if you can be uh, led to dishonor that easily, then you're not a reliable person to be in business with sort of thing. So uh, that's that's the thing. Sometimes these lessons are cheaper than others. You know, so you probably ought to tone that down now, honey bunny. Let's get back to mining. But yeah, um, that's what we were talking about. There is the, the glycine leaching that uh, apparently Jean-Francois ran into that concept uh, at a big mining conference up there. I think it was in Canada. It's one of the biggest ones in the world, according to him. And uh, so that... That's what we're talking about. It may be a non-toxic alternative um, to uh, cyanide that uh, might have some advantages. I haven't, I haven't done anything to um, follow up on the information, so I'm, I'm just uh, <laughs> um, very, very general concept at this point. But uh, you can you can look it up yourself and see what we're what was being discussed mm -hmm. there. Okay. Hi, everybody. Anywho, it has been a bloodbath. <laughs> An absolute bloodbath on social media. It's been a bloodbath in the news. Well, an utter and complete lack of news is still a bloodbath. Or at least the goddess heard there was some sort of bloodbathiness going on somewhere. Hmm. No clue. In case you missed it, there was a startling denouement and a potential cliffhanger in that whole thing going on down in Georgia with that Thawney person. The Wade person tendered his resignation after getting very rude looks on his face when he was sitting there um, in the courtroom. The Thawney person is apparently still in charge. And... The fire department in New York has decided, after originally saying that they were going to hunt down and, and seriously chastise all those firefighters that were booing Letitia James, well, they kind of rethought their position on that one. Very interesting how that happens. No idea why that happens. I mean, after all, the goddess is still trying to figure out why they were having... A state attorney general giving away awards in an award ceremony. It seems to me that you would have your fire chief giving away achievement awards in your fire department award ceremony. But then again, it also Silly seems person. to the goddess that your fire chief would actually be somebody that had once upon a time been a fireman. That apparently is not the case in uh. New York. Go figure. Just saying. Global commodity trading profits topped 
one hundred billion with a B for the second best year ever. Wow, let's see what this is all about here. The commodity trading industry reaped its second best year ever, ever in terms of profits. Banking over one hundred billion with a B and building up a mountain of cash to spend on assets and breaking into new markets. God just wonders if those are gross profits, adjusted profits, or net profits. Who knows? While earning a spell from 2022's blockbuster records, profits across the sector still easily eclipsed prior highlights, such as 2008 to 2009, according to analysis from consultancy Oliver Wyman LLC. So let's see if the goddess has this right. If memory serves. In 2008 to 2009, we were in the middle of the global Great Recession. Were we not,、uh, Professor Hard Rock? Yeah. Were we not in the middle of the global Great Recession at the time? Ah,、uh, it was a pandemic. They didn't call it a recession. No, 2008 to 2009. 2008, yeah. yeah. So in 2008, 2009. Which was up until this year, the second highest commodities market profits ever. The commodities market had huge profits, and now here we are in you know twenty twenty four with all sane, rational. Economic indicators looking seriously bad, and the commodities market has turned in record profits. As a matter of fact, earnings fell from 2022's blockbuster records. Now, unless the goddess is mistaken, 2022 wasn't that still in the midst of global pandemic and supply no, chain no, fractures? We- We, Or was that after? We had the COVID backs. It was all taken care of then. Well, at any rate, the goddess is beginning to wonder if perhaps commodities earnings report run contrary to reality. You know how it is with some of these numbers. the The bigger the number is, the worse things are. We saw pretty good margins overall, and it's practically because things continue to be a little bit tight on the supply and demand side. Okay, so they saw pretty good margins overall, because things continue to be a little bit tight on the supply slash demand side. In other words, it's hard to get shit. So yes, people are paying more for it. Apparently, consultant Adam Perkins said in an interview. Results from many players across the industry are not yet public, but profits at the biggest independent trading houses are expected to show an average drop of over thirty percent. From 2022's record levels, reports show. So, commodity trading gross margins fell from record levels in 2022, but have maintained their upward trend. Interesting. Still, disruptions in supply shortages of diesel and fuel oil offset lower Russia-related volatility in crude oil, while margins trading gas and power also remain relatively high. The firms that buy, store, and ship the world's resources are coming out of what was the most profitable period in their history, with a huge war chest to cement their role as strategic providers of energy, metals, and food. As the West considers a continues a stuttering transition away from fossil fuels, demand for which continue to grow the world over. The goddess strongly suggests that you take some time later on here after the broadcast to cogitate on what that means. They've already brought oil refineries, storage assets, power plants, and even other trading companies, while receiving large amounts of backing from countries like Italy, Germany, the U.S., and Saudi Arabia. 
to guarantee supplies of essential commodities like gas and copper. Traditionally, this position in energy security wouldn't have been held by an independent trader, Perkins said, but they're being drawn into that role. Meanwhile, though share buybacks and dividend pay cuts, the executives who own shares or are partners in these mostly private companies have also become multimillionaires in the process. Funny how that works. That's helping accelerate a shift at the top of some of these firms as minted traders retire, passing management on to the new guard. I think it's a great opportunity for those people who are coming in. It's also a little bit nerve-wracking. There's an increased amount of scrutiny. Everyone wants to continue the legacy, said Perkins. Um, does this mean... The experienced traders are getting out while the getting is good. The goddess is beginning to wonder about that because the goddess has noticed a whole lot of really old school names seem to be divesting themselves of a lot of shit. Why, <laughs> even the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, that criminal banking enterprise extraordinaire, is divesting himself of large amounts of stock. And a whole lot of really old school dudes kind of disappearing. The goddess does have to wonder about this because it seems like the rats may be fleeing the slowly sinking ship. Just saying. Hmm. Very, very odd stuff going on there. But then again, there's a lot of odd stuff going on in the world these days. Pebble Mine developer sues the EPA over Alaska Mine Veto. Northern Dynasty Minerals, the developer of the proposed pebble, copper, and gold mine in southwest Alaska, has sued the United States Environmental Protection Agency, seeking to overturn the agency's veto of the project. The developer on Friday filed a lawsuit in federal court in Anchorage, challenging the EPA's 2023 final determination, prohibiting the discharge of mining waste in the state's Bristol Bay, over concerns the materials would degrade the watershed and harm important fishing ecosystems. Well, derp. Discharging mining waste into Bristol Bay is a very, very rude thing to do to one's neighbors. You would think they would know better, especially since there actually is technology to deal with this. The problem is, the technology to deal with this will drive up the all-in sustaining costs on this project. Northern Dynasty said the determination made under the Clean Water Act was arbitrary and capricious. Well, of course it is. It's the EPA. It's the Clean Water Act. They were expecting rational behavior? Really now? And a violation of federal administrative law. Like, that isn't an everyday occurrence, right? Because it failed to adequately consider the economic impact of the decision. Yeah, the government never considers that. And used a wild overestimate of what protected waterways would be impacted by mining activity. Well, yeah, the government does that too. Northern Dynasty claims it has spent at least $1 billion with a B over two decades in efforts to develop the project, which was effectively killed by the decision, including $200 million with an M dollars on environmental studies. This is just another example of gross EPA overreach. Well, what else is new? Of the powers granted to it by Congress. The goddess suggests that that these people actually read the powers granted by Congress since they are, in general, so vague as to be unenforceable and therefore null and void. So, just saying. Just, you know. Said Ron Tyson, Northern Dynasty's president and CEO, in a statement. The EPA didn't immediately respond to a request for comment on Monday. The Bristol Bay watershed in southwestern Alaska supports the world's largest sockeye salmon fishery and is known for its large mineral resources. The watershed also provides habitat for 29 species of fish, more than 190 species of birds, and dozens of mammals, according to the EPA. The proposed mine, which has languished in a lengthy approval and permitting process for decades, but has not started construction, would tap one of the world's largest copper and gold deposits. EPA claims it would permanently destroy over 2,000 acres of wetlands protected by the Clean Water Act. 2,000 acres? Yes. 2,000 acres. 
Five square miles? That's what it says. 2,000 acres. Wow. Yeah, I got it. I think you're wrong about it being five square miles, though, because 640 acres is one square mile. So, so, so about three square miles, three and a half, three and a yeah. third. The developer also filed a lawsuit against the U.S. government on Thursday, alleging the veto amounted to an unconstitutional taking of its property, well, of course, which is a violation of the U.S. Constitution's Fifth Amendments, which states that private property cannot be taken for public use without co compensation. Just compensation. Well, it says, the article says without compensation. The law, the Constitution says without just compensation. In the U.S. Court of Federal Claims in Washington, D.C. Good luck with that one. <laughs> the state of Alaska also sued the U.S. government in that court last week, seeking $700 billion with a B Ooh. over the decision. Arguing the EPA's veto infringed on the state's sovereignty, which it does, and would deprive it of funds from taxes, which it does, licensing fees, yep, and royalties, yep, it would have received from the mine. It should also be noted that the federal government is um, unilaterally shutting down a lot of drilling for oil in Alaska as well. The state had already challenged the EPA's decision last year directly with the Supreme Court, arguing it violated the state's sovereign right to regulate its land and waters, as well as a 1976 land swap with the U.S. government that gave the state ownership over the area in question. The goddess was looking at that the last time she checked in on what was going on up there at Pebble, and uh, yeah, it pretty much looks like the federal government is being an Indian giver. <gasps> They're trying to do take seas back seas on land that was part of an actual land swap. What else is new? The Supreme Court declined to take that case in January because they're a bunch of sellouts who like to kick the can, but did not say why. I'm surprised they didn't say lack of standing. That's their usual excuse. The developer's new lawsuit in Alaska makes similar claims, arguing the Clean Water Act does not give the EPA authority to override the state's preferences for using land for extracting valuable minerals. The EPA had previously argued in a brief submitted to the Supreme Court that Alaska statehood and the land swap do not preclude the agency from evaluating projects to ensure they comply with environmental law. The case is Northern Dynasty Minerals Limited versus U U.S. EPA, U.S. District Court for the District of Alaska, number C, colon, 24-CV-00059. Okay. They absolutely need to make sure that any mining discharge that goes into Bristol Bay is nice and clean. And yes, it can be done. This particular mining project that they're looking at is not some bleeding edge high tech thing where a lot can go wrong. There is a lot of settled science and a lot of settled technology that can be used in this case. And yes, the goddess firmly believes that the state of Alaska definitely has the right to regulate how state land is used and the federal government can go stuff it. Just saying. We all know what the feds are like. But it will be interesting to watch this case because in this particular case, we are seeing the fed once again advancing the goalposts on how public land is dealt with. Every case like this, we see the federal government pushing more boundaries. We see the federal government trying to take back land that they already swapped with somebody. That is not federal land. It is now state land. The Fed got their own land for that. We see the federal government trying to regulate what happens on private land and render the value of private land that was bought at great cost basically zero because nothing can be done with it. We see the federal government pushing a whole lot of limits here. Land status is going to become a major, major battleground in our industry that will affect everyone from the littlest prospector doing some dry washing 
or the gold prospectors of America's claims, their placer claims and load claims that they have for their members to play around on, or little guys like us, or big guys like the guys doing Pebble, okay? Public land use, private land use, and regulation of land use is going to be a huge, huge issue going forward, as will be land status. This is why if you have any, any capability, if you have a choice between two essentially equal projects, and one is on Forest Service land and one's on BLM land, take BLM. If you have a choice between two essentially equal projects and one's on state land and one's on BLM land, take the state land. And if you have a choice between two essentially equal projects and one is private land that you have to pay for with a patented mining claim on it, and the other one is any other kind of land, get your land status taken care of and do the maintenance that you need to do every single year. Check your claim markers every year. Check your paperwork every year. Make sure everything is filed with your county and BLM or Forest Service or whoever every year. Keep that shit up to date because the land status is going to become a serious problem. It is already a serious problem. It's only going to get worse. Okay. And in other random and unrelated news, in case you missed it, Tyson Foods has gone got themselves in a little bit of a curve. So let's take a look at the situation there. Now, Tyson, well, first we're going to have to talk about pork. We haven't talked about pork in a while. The entire pork industry in the United States is pretty much in the hands of two companies now. Smithfield, which is owned by China, um, covers about 75% of the pork in the country. The rest of the country, and the pork in the country, is covered by Tyson. Now, when people think of Tyson, they think of Tyson chicken. They think of Tyson chicken nuggies. They think of Tyson chicken thighs. They think of Tyson chicken roasters and broilers. And boneless, skinless chicken breasts. And... Tyson frozen chicken patty thingies and parts stuff parts. like that and parts. You may not think about Hillshire Farms. You may not think about Ballpark Franks. You may not think about Sarah Lee, of all people. And you may not think about this, but your Chick-fil-A and your McDonald's and your Burger King, probably your local elementary schools and high schools, almost definitely your prisons, are getting all their chicken, about 60% of their pork, and about 5% of their beef from none other than Tyson Foods. Okay? Well, in the middle of all this, there was a Tyson pork plant. It was out there in Iowa, some such ridiculous place. You know, employs, it employs about 1,200, 1,300 people. Well, in the midst of downsizing because of economic downturns and various corporate noises claiming that, you know, they kind of had to cut corners, they decided they were going to close down this particular little plant, which did a specialty product that was a little bit more involved than some of the other stuff that they do that they don't have much of a market for anymore. So they are going to be laying off these 12, 1300 people. Well, this happens and everybody understands that this happens. What we're having problems understanding now is at the very same time this happened, none other than Tyson Foods had recently been at a job fair in New York State, of all bizarre and unaccountable places. And at that job fair in New York State, they were hiring criminal aliens who were seeking asylum. And they're paying these Criminal aliens who are seeking asylum, $16.50 an hour, just like most unskilled new hires, plus free immigration lawyers. Well, that didn't look good. So Tyson, in an attempt to do some damage control here, put out a nice little statement on social media pointing out that they have always fought against illegal immigration, and they have worked hand in glove 
with our beloved federal government to ensure an ethically sourced workforce, blah, 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 yak, yak, yak. Ethically sourced? That well, doesn't sound good. <laughs> the most cursory examination of their work records and court records with the federal government revealed the sad and sorry truth that on the average of about once a year or two, the ICE people will be raiding a Tyson plant someplace or other, and they'll discover half the workforce as criminal aliens, and then they go and they ding Tyson with a couple of million dollars in fines, and that batch of criminal aliens temporarily disappears, and the whole thing is uh, wash, rinse, and repeat about a year later, okay? So that press release on social media didn't go all that well when people started challenging that. I will say, at least Tyson didn't close all their comments on social media. Neither is Planet Fitness, by the way. But um, that doesn't mean they're answering anybody, but at least they haven't locked their comments and they're not wholesale deleting people yet. But this did not soothe any ruffled feathers, especially since it turns out in the middle of their so-called downsizing, they're going to be opening several new plants and opening up some jobs in Tennessee, etc. Unfortunately, the goal is not to hire American citizens. The goal is to increase the current 42,000 immigrants, or shall we say green card workers or asylum seekers, whatever they feel like calling themselves. There are 42,000 out of 120,000 employees that are not American citizens. They're looking to double that number to 84,000. Now, this is where things get a little odd. Because they did not say they were increasing the total number of employees by 42,000. They also didn't say They were laying anybody off. So all of a sudden, they want to take their workforce from 120,000, with 42,000 being non-U.S. citizens, of varying degrees of um, citizenship status. And they want, well, they didn't say they were increasing their total workforce to 162,000 from 120. So if they add another 42,000 in here, but they don't increase their workforce, there's only a couple of ways they can do that. One way they can do that is by hiring 42,000 people that are not American citizens and agreeing to pay their immigration lawyers to get them legal while also paying standard pay and benefits. Or... They can cut everybody's hours. So they go from having 120,000 full-time employees to 120,000 employees that are working three-quarter time or a little over part-time or somewhere in the middle here, high enough to go broke on, but low enough that they don't have to get benefits anymore. Now, that's another possibility. Since they have not said, well... We are increasing our total workforce from 120,000 to 162,000 by hiring another 42,000 non-Americans to work in our factories. The goddess is erring on the side of caution and saying that they may be going to be doing something that is going to be even more ridiculous, rude, un-American, and unethical than what they're already doing. But then we get to the more interesting point. If they're not paying these non-citizens less than they pay entry-level U.S. citizens, if those non-citizens are getting the same pay and the same benefits as U.S. citizens, which is what Tyson claims, and they're also getting free lawyers, which is something that Tyson does not offer to any of their other employees, Well, the free lawyer thing constitutes another benefit, and I do believe there's something in the law about how you're supposed to get equal pay and benefits under the law, regardless of your gender, your age, and your race and everything. So uh, we may have a problem there. 
But more to the point, you have to wonder who's making up the money. And this is where an interesting story comes in. Some years ago, as you know, we used to live in the People's Republic of Tucson, Arizona. The People's Republic of Tucson had Fry's grocery stores, which are Kroger family stores. Those stores used to hire criminals. And they'd also hire differently abled adults who had handlers because they were incapable of working otherwise. They paid these people the same money that they paid ordinary folks, okay? These people lived in halfway houses. And some of these people would get verbally or even physically abusive with customers. It turned out that Kroger was not allowed to fire them even if they did assault somebody because Kroger had climbed in bed with some sort of non-governmental organization and the state government and the feds to hire these otherwise unemployable people. These unemployable people were getting paid on paper the exact same money that Fry's was paying ordinary citizens, you know, non-criminals and non-differently abled individuals and non-recovering drug addicts, etc. The difference was because of the tax breaks and the extra grant money and incentive money that Kroger was getting from the state and federal government, they were actually making a profit of over $3 an hour for every one of those employees. Go figure. So the goddess is wondering now, the goddess can't see Tyson or any other company being willing to take a serious financial loss, hiring 42,000 people who cannot speak English, who don't have a known vaccination status and are not by law required to have the vaccinations against communicable diseases that most legal immigrants have to have to work in this country, that are not skilled, etc. In other words, it's very expensive to onboard a new hire that does speak English, that does have decent health, that does have the required vaccinations to work in food service. It's probably even more expensive to onboard a new employee that has none of the above. So who's paying Tyson and how much is what the goddess would like to know. Oh, and in the little side note about Planet Fitness, they haven't shut off their comments either, but they are studiously ignoring everybody who points out to them that we actual human, real females, as in biological women with two X's and no Mr. Happy and the twins, don't appreciate having to share our locker rooms with dudes especially not dudes that are not dressed like chicks and are shaving and things, you know. But, oh dear, they have doubled and tripled down on the fact that Planet Fitness is a no-judgment zone. So anybody, just so you guys know, any guy who self-identifies as a chick or any chick that self-identifies as a guy gets to use the opposite dressing room. No questions asked. And nobody's allowed to give you any shit. So if y'all would like to find out, if y'all chicks would like to find out and you belong to Planet Fitness, what things look like in the men's dressing room, I suggest you tell them that you're a dude now. So you can go in there. And then you can scream bloody murder when you see a Mr. Happy and the twins and say that all those dudes got to put their clothes on because you are getting dysphoric or something. I don't know. I'm sure we can come up with something to make their lives miserable. The goddess is just going to cancel her subscription. The only problem with this is according to the fine print, if they really want to, they can make me pay for a year unless I cancel it just before my re-up. And I think my re-up has already passed. So that is kind of a bummer, but that's just typical of this kind of shit. (coughs) Yeah, they went and got themselves in trouble on that issue. But... If the goddess lived in a part of the world where there was likely to be a dude in that locker room, I could get my (laughs) subscription canceled immediately.
by throwing a fit, screaming, and misgendering said dude. So there is that. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen here. Meanwhile, the mainstream media, you know, those people, doesn't get why people own gold. Well, of course not. They're propagandists and state-run apparatchiks. chicks. They don't want us to know about gold. The much-anticipated into some much-dreaded rematch between Joe Biden and Donald Trump is now official. Last week, both candidates locked up enough delegates to secure their respective parties' nominations for a president. Ooh. There are stark differences between them, no doubt. But the election is unlikely to change anything about the trajectory of federal finances. Note the number on the board back there. Those who are concerned about rising deficits, a depreciating Federal Reserve note dollar, entrenched inflation, and the potential for black swan events, such as a banking system meltdown, war, or other natural disasters, often look to precious metals for protection. People who own physical gold and silver as part of a financial preparedness strategy were ridiculed in a recent CNBC article as doomsday preppers. Yes, we're all doomsday preppers. Cool. An academic quoted in the article. Oh, well, that explains the issue. Apparently attempting to link gold buyers to supporters of Donald Trump, stated the turn toward gold is like to turn toward authoritarian leaders, toward the ideal of someone who knows what is true and right, and who has the courage to return a nation to its former truth and greatness. Okay, let's reread this. Well, let's reread this here. The turn toward gold is like the turn toward authoritarian leaders, which is supposedly a bad thing, toward the ideal of someone who knows what is true and right and who has the courage to return a nation to its former truth and greatness. Is there a problem? Yeah. In what universe is that a problem? Really now? Well, apparently in academia, it's a problem. In reality, people buy gold primarily for the opposite reason. They fear authoritarian government controls and are skeptical that any political figure can be fully trusted to do what is true and right. Yeah, really. Gold is honest money. Honest money never faileth. Okay. The fact that it recently surged to a new record high in terms of Federal Reserve notes reflects the dishonesty of the fiat currency regime. Sound money advocates don't expect Donald Trump, if elected president again, to single-handedly fix what's broken with the nation's fiscal and monetary policy. They instead expect more debt, more inflation, and the eventual reckoning that could be painful for lots of people who are unprepared. Being prepared is not a dug-in ideological position, as so some gold naysayers in the media suggest. Economic risks, including that of a currency crisis, can jeopardize your personal financial security, regardless of whether you're a Republican, a Democrat, or an Independent. Of course, those who blindly put their trust in Washington, D.C. to solve the nation's financial problems will probably see no need to prepare for hard times. For those who are a bit more skeptical of the powers that be, physical gold and silver represent tangible wealth that requires no trust and has no counterparty risk. And yes, a very rare thing happened on Friday. In case you missed it, silver finally outperformed gold temporarily. The gold-silver ratio fell on Friday to its lowest level of the year, indicating that right then, for about a minute, silver is now outperforming gold. It's not yet clear whether this is a major trend development or just a blip on the chart. A move below 80 to 1 would be more meaningful. Yes, it would. A falling gold to silver ratio is generally a healthy sign for a precious metals bull market. It got as low as 32 to 1 at the 2011 peak in silver prices and briefly fell below 16 to 1 during the 1980 manic move higher. 
Given silver still has a long way to go in order to make a new nominal record high, about $50 an ounce, <clears throat> silver can be expected to narrow the price gap with the glitzier metal on its way there. First, though, bulls will need to see silver break above $26.50 an ounce, the high point from last year. Would be nice. Not counting on it. Doesn't matter if you dollar cost average. Because right now, silver and gold are still on sale, which means every single paycheck you should be taking some of that pretty fiat and turning it into real money. Just saying. I mean, that's what you're supposed to do with it. The FBI must answer for $2,000 is sold from a safety deposit box. The judge rules. Good luck with that one. We get to ask the FBI some uncomfortable questions about what happened to the missing $2,000. I literally couldn't be looking forward to that more. A federal judge has denied the Justice Department's motion to dismiss a lawsuit against the FBI over its illegal raid of hundreds of renters' safe deposit boxes in Beverly Hills, meaning that the Bureau will have to answer questions about $2,000 that went missing from that raid. Really now? The judge's Thursday decision stems from an investigation the FBI opened into U.S. private vaults, <clears throat> USPV, a company that, unlike typical banks, provided safety deposit boxes to customers without requiring identification. The FBI had been investigating individual USPV customers, but determined the real problem was USPV, which they believed served as a money laundering facilitator. Not unlike the FBI. Not unlike the CIA. They don't like competition. Not unlike the DOJ in general. Ooh. Accordingly, the FBI raided the entire USPV vault in 2021. Even though the warrant authorizing the raid only permitted the FBI to open boxes to identify their owners and safeguard the contents, agents rummaged through hundreds of boxes, ran currency they found in front of drug-sniffing dogs, and made copies of people's most personal records, according to the Institute for Justice, which filed a lawsuit on behalf of multiple non-criminal USPV customers. As, US, as Headline USA reported in January, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled the FBI acted unlawfully in its 2021 raid on USPV. And yeah, you heard that right. The Ninth Circus actually had one of those rare moments of sanity. That's scary. Thursday's decision comes from a separate but related lawsuit by Jenny Pearsons, who was also part of the above-referenced litigation. Pearson's had the content of her safety deposit box returned to her last year, except that there was $2,000 missing, which led to her suing again last September. Okay? <clears throat> when Jenny sued, the government argued there was literally no remedy for the loss of her two grand. The government invoked a doctrine called sovereign immunity. The idea that you can't sue the government for damages. Okay. Well... Yesterday, the district court rejected that argument. The takings clause, back to takings clauses, bars the government from taking private property without just compensation. That means if the government takes your two grand and never gives it back, the government has to compensate you for that loss. How does Jenny know that 2000 went missing from her box? Whenever she visited the box, she took a picture of the contents. It's a good idea. And when she visited the box in February 2021, just a month before the raid, she took a picture of the cash. But when the FBI returned the contents of the box, there was no cash at all. Odd how that happens. Money just go poof. You know, just saying. Explains Rob Johnson, lawyer for the Institute for Justice. The DOJ argued that Pearson's lawsuit should be dismissed on sovereign immunity grounds. The notion that the government is shielded from being sued for individual damages. But the presiding judge rejected that argument Thursday. So now the case moves forward to discovery. Mm -hmm. Meaning we get to ask the FBI some uncomfortable questions. How about what exactly happened 
to the missing 2000. I literally couldn't be looking forward to that more, Johnson said. Good luck, Mr. Johnson. Dollars to donuts. All of the information pertaining to that safety deposit box accidentally got deleted, you know, or eaten by a virus or eaten by snakes or confiscated by Come aliens or who Come the hell knows. It. Yeah, something. Something happened to it. Just <clears throat> saying, okay? But that is where we are in that regard. And um, in semi-related and totally random news, President Trump is uh, may actually have to sell some property to come up with that half a billion dollars that the crooked judge in New York wants from him as a bond before he can appeal his case. The goddess has to wonder about all that in terms of legality. Just saying. Meanwhile, gold closed at $2,179.70. And silver at $24.42. Well, $2,509 is what it actually closed at. Platinum, $912. Palladium, $1,008. And rhodium, $4,600. Ooh. Way to go on that if your person happens to actually want some palladium and rhodium and all that good stuff. Just saying. And gold investors are waiting for the CPI report on Tuesday. Yes, indeed. It is another Tuesday tomorrow. And yes, indeed, because of the time of the month, it is a Tuesday when some absolutely random, meaningless, and completely fictitious government numbers are going to be released again. I love days like this. It is so nice. To be reassured that we have the most historic, fantastic, and amazing economy ever in the history of the universe. Just saying. Gold investors wait for CPI report on Tuesday. Gold traders and investors are acutely aware of the dynamic impact tomorrow's CPI report will have on multiple financial sectors, including gold prices. Gold futures basis, the most active April contact, traded to a higher low and a lower high than Friday. Although gold is trading fractionally higher than Friday's close, today's trading range and the open and closing prices have formed a Japanese candlestick called a doji, which means the same thing in Japanese. A doji is the name of a trade given to a trading session on a daily chart in which the opening and closing levels are virtually equal. This is represented by a candlestick on a chart that looks like a plus sign. Although it can contain longer or shorter wicks to either side or both. Based on this shape, market technicians make assumptions about price behavior. In other words, buy a mighty magic eight ball. They're more reliable. Just saying. A doji generally signals either a trend reversal indication for analysts, but it can also signal indecision or consolidation about future prices. The key takeaway <clears throat> from this kind of Japanese candlestick is neither the bullish nor the bearish faction was able to gain control, which would create a green candlestick when the close is above opening prices, or a red candle when the session's closing price is below the opening price. The larger the candlestick, the more controlling faction was able to move pricing in the desired direction. That's why little to no body size indicates neither side was successful. So that's where we are, okay? We have another fake number coming out tomorrow. We shall see what the fake number is. The goddess isn't really all that concerned because gold and silver are still on sale. That is what is important right now. Oh, and if any of you have young kids, you may be aware that if your young children decide, you know, like seven, eight years old and up, decide to suddenly stop showing up at school, you're probably going to get in trouble. You might also be aware that if your seven-year-old children were found peddling candy or sodas in the subway during school hours, 
you'd probably be in a shit ton of trouble. Unless, of course, you're a criminal alien and you're in New York. Amazingly enough, the New York subways are so unsafe that they now are being staffed with National Guard that are doing weapons checks in purses and stuff. And despite that, a dude got shot in the head on a New York subway the other day. After getting in an argument with somebody, after buying a gun on the subway. Now, the goddess has a whole lot of questions about that story because who conducts a gun sale on a subway? But uh, anyway, be that as it may, New York subways are so unsafe that this kind of shit is happening. And your children are expected to stay under the thumb of your local school system and several government agencies at any given <clears throat> time. And if you do not follow a very, very long list of rules as to how you parent your children, you can get in a whole shit ton of trouble. However, there is currently a serious child labor problem going on in the city of New York. And it's not the only city with a subway system that this is happening in, but New York is the worst because the subway stations are being overrun with children as young as seven years old who are selling everything from chiclets and sodas to um, pickpocketed items and all kinds of other things. And the city of New York seems remarkably unconcerned with the fact that these children aren't in school. And they seem remarkably unconcerned with the fact that seven-year-old children are spending hours and hours utterly and completely unsupervised in subway stations. As a matter of fact, they seem remarkably concerned, unconcerned about a whole lot of interesting things. So we shall be watching this to see what's going on there. Because it is quite bizarre to see this latest manifestation of our two-tiered justice system, as in rules for thee but not for me type thing. I mean, I think all of us are getting used to that by now, but every once in a while something like this happens that is a jarring reminder. And uh, speaking of New York City, if you haven't seen the movie Cabrini, four thumbs up, five thumbs up, a four-handkerchief movie, damn good acting. The goddess will say she agrees with the Catholics who are saying, well, there seems to be a remarkable shortage of religion for a movie about America's first saint. That said, it's a fucking amazing movie. Gotta see that. Oh, I, I cried. Fuck it. Beautifully, beautifully done movie. Absolutely. And if you haven't seen Dylan Mulvaney's music video, the dude in the dress went and became a pop star this week. Unfortunately, his video about, you know, the days of girlhood or whatever he called it, for some bizarre and unaccountable reason, pissed off and insulted a whole lot of chicks, as in genuine females, not dudes in dresses. Even genuine chicks who like him were pissed off. I will say that I believe he has a far better voice when he doesn't auto-tune it all to hell. He has a very good voice for a man. It's not an opera quality voice. But he has a very good male singing voice. There was no need to auto-tune it to the point where he sounded like Tiffany or something, you know. No need to do that. But yeah, his pop singing debut didn't go as well as he was expecting, I don't think, because somehow he managed to insult a whole bunch of women. It might have something to do with implying that what makes girlhood is getting up late, having no life, doing lots of drugs, sleeping with anything and everything, and lots of retail therapy and getting drunk. It might have something to do with that, you know, just maybe. Because, let's face it, there's a whole lot more to being a chick than that. Just saying. 
But that's where that situation is. And the goddess will still say that there were a couple of outfits in that video that I personally would die for. I don't know who chooses that dude's vintage clothing choices. But they have a very good eye for getting that Marlo Thomas look going on. So good at that. Unfortunately, it's on a dude rather than a chick. But, you know, you can't have everything. Just saying. And uh, the number that was up there on the board has now officially gone up $100 million since I started talking. So there is that. Bear in mind... You can expect to see a rise in egg prices over the next month or two. You can expect to see a fairly sharp rise in beef prices because of those wildfires that happened down in Texas, killing off a lot of beef that was due to come to the market over the next several months. So plan your pantry accordingly and start keeping a closer eye on sourcing your meat in bulk. Because we're going to see more meat prices going up through the summer and through the fall as energy prices and feed prices continue to get out of control. So there is that too. And remember, if you don't hold it, you will not want it. Bye-bye. <gasps>And in a lighter note, I saw something today that was shown on another video, and so I looked it up and everything. And uh, it was probably a deep fake. But I'm pretty it sure it was a deep fake. Well, or just a fake. I don't know how deep it was, but uh, it was a video showing your typical immigrant lady. Roasting some uh, meat on the side of the sidewalk. Big bed of coals and stuff, and she's hand crank. And it was rats. <laughs> you know, on a, on a rotisserie, hand cranks sort of thing. Pretty sure the rats weren't what was really on that rotisserie. It was probably like chickens or something like that, and it got essentially Photoshopped. But it was pretty hilarious. <laughs> uh so, anyhow, I say, it, looking carefully at the rats, they just didn't look as realistic as I think they should have been. Okay, glycine needs to be heated to get gold, 115 Fahrenheit. Add hydrogen peroxide and recover the carbon. pH of 8.5 to 11.5. Oh, I'm sure some of them do. I say this particular video didn't look the the rats themselves didn't look realistic enough, in my opinion. But it was uh, well, also pretty funny. One of them had what looked like a tail that was flopping around from the middle of the body as it spun, but they had the color and look of chickens. Yeah. So. Anyhow, I say it looked a bit odd. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of funny, though. I laughed my ass off. So glycine needs to be heated to 115 at H2O2, recover with carbon. Sound familiar? Yeah, it'd be interesting to see what the detailed chemistry is, what complexes are being formed. Um, did the video mention what complex is being formed or not? Because that's that's kind of a, an important factor. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know for sure, but what was the concentration of glycine needed? Uh, the H2O2 wouldn't be too, now yeah, 1 to 2% H2O2. That's a lot of H2O2. Um, what percentage of glycine, uh, Brian? It might be good for um, 
recovering gold from concentrates or something like that, but uneconomic for raw ore. It's hard to tell. You know, the pH doesn't look very expensive. Hmm. So by adjusting the temperature, you adjust the um, the, the metals that you actually get. Do you have to get it to the higher temperatures in order to get the gold? And also, hydrogen peroxide is not very stable in the environment. Okay? And uh, as such, it would... I'm pretty sure it would be a consumable, okay? A glycine, don't know what the stability is on that. I can tell you this, the thiourea in our stripping circuit is a consumable. You know, we use, um, oh, about 100 grams of thiourea per 300 grams of uh, carbon stripped, I mean, uh, of resin stripped, I believe, okay? So it is a consumable, but uh, that's all I know. And, uh, you know, something we, we might could try a little one too. Yeah. I don't know the chemistry of this, but... If the hydroxide radicals tend to kick ions, Barek is going 80% glycine. That's got to be expensive. Um, so let's see. Let me uh, get this one. That's just a looky thing. Let me get another one, and then I can star that one. Uh, oops, nope. Start here. Yep. Gold glycine, glycine gold leaching race with permanganate. Yeah, that would be another oxidizer. Okay. That would be a good oxidizer. Thank you, honey bunny. Uh, no, I'm just, what I'm saying, Brian, is that if you were to try, like, pad leaching or something, I suspect the hydrogen peroxide would be, because um, it'll, it'll tend to degrade to water and oxygen, and then the oxygen outgasses. Um, and the, the glycine itself, if you're going to run a very high concentration of glycine, you might run into a um, regulatory agency situation in terms of glycine probably isn't terribly toxic, but large quantities of it might be a problem. And also the solution, uh, he left just before you showed up, Rock. He went to bed. He was here earlier. Um, he is the one that came up with the glycine thing. But uh, to make a large amount of solution, if you're running 80% glycine, it's going to be a pretty expensive per gallon, so to speak. Uh, with the Eco Goldex, we're running what percent Eco Gold? As well, it's pounds per ton. We have about six pounds per ton. So. Six divided by 2,000, okay, 0.3%. So there's, again, this is where a lot of these things run into a, a barrier is it's just more costly than something else. It may work just fine. It may be non-toxic, but th that's why I was saying it might be a good, um, chemistry to use on concentrates or very high grade ore or something like that. Sounds to me like it's something just off the cuff 
that would be more likely to be advantageous in small quantities at a high grade, uh, a high head grade. I say either really high grade ore or a concentrate would be my guess. Also, if you have to keep it at an elevated temperature, that in and of itself tends to limit how much you can do. You have to be in a heated system. Although summertime in Arizona, you could achieve those temperatures without too much trouble. Five grams per liter. Well, that's not that much. I guess 80% glycine is the uh, chemical source. So five divided by, yeah, 0.5%. A little bit more, but not too much. There you get into the cost per gram of the material. Glycine probably doesn't have the shipping uh, costs Five that Eco Gold X does. Liter. Yeah. And we use 1,100 liters of liquid, so that would be. Up well, there. we use about point. Uh, we use about three grams per liter. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it it could be in the ballpark. I'd have to do some more research. But, uh, you know, if you got food grade, clearly it's not going to have nearly the kind of hazmat shipping <laughs> as Eco Goldex does or a number of other things do. So, again, it, it deserves a look. And we'll, we'll get to it. But we'll have to, as I say, I have to research it a little bit and then come up with a plan. I hate that part, the plan, the plan. <clears throat> That's a very expensive heater. Well, it depends. Say, if it's in Yuma in the summertime, it's not an expensive heater at all. You know? So, um, I say these are the sort of things where you can just, you know, cover a pond. Oh, five grams for the Eco Gold X? Okay. Yeah. That's, we're running a little bit lower than that, but then we're using a, uh, uh, tank leach and stuff. So we, uh, so um, let's say we've we've done some testing to see that it seems to work pretty well, uh, increasing the temperature and uh, maybe oxidizing potential may be more important in the long run. Uh, yeah, I've got got some ideas in terms of uh, equipment systems. That if they work out, may have um, economic benefits that would be pretty good. We shall have to see. Okay, Brian. But uh, say it's a it's an interesting concept. I know that thiourea can leach gold. I know that uh, thiosulfate can leach gold. I know that. What is it, hydrochloric acid and salt or something like that? I wouldn't know, honey bunny. You may be right. Yeah, a solar swimming pool heater or on a larger thing, uh, a solar pond uh, might work. Those can generate pretty high temperatures. Uh, pretty efficiently, but they're, they're big, you know, but for their size, they're about as cheap as you can get. So I don't know. There's all kinds of possibilities. So say so there's, there's a lot of possibilities. Yeah. Uh, so the, these are, and then you get into the idiosyncrasies of your ore. Okay. Um, you know, different ores are going to react differently in different situations. Clearly, if you have a a basic leaching system and you've got a an acidic ore, you're going to use a lot more chemicals than if you've got a basic ore. So there's a lot of a lot of things. Most of the systems we've looked at 
are on the basic side, but I know thiourea is an acidic system. And so that works in an entirely different regime. And these are the sort of things that you got to balance. Um, other minerals that may cause problems in terms of, well, we really won't, don't want to dissolve that, that sort of thing. <laughs> oh, yeah, that wouldn't surprise me, honey bunny. Sometimes the, the hazmat shipping is just freaking insane. That's one reason for some of these things, we just go to the local chemical supplier because they, you know, routinely ship stuff like that. Thank you, Brian. So let's say that's, you know, there's various possibilities here. We shall see what we shall see. And another thing is regulatory stuff. For example, if they look at a glycine system, look at all the different things, say, piece of cake. They look at Eco Goldex and says, what exactly is going on here? We don't know. We're not just going to approve that without a lot of testing. But it might make more sense to go with the glycine. Okay. Um, these are the sort of things. You know, you just, there's, there's so many variables as to what makes economic sense as opposed to technical sense. Um, there's a lot more technical possibilities than there are economic optima, <laughs> which is, of course, in the long run, what you're looking for. What recovers the most gold for the least amount of uh, cost? And that gets into all kinds of variables like mineralogy, pH of the ore, pH of solutions, the extraction from solution methodology, permitting, just all kinds of stuff, you know? Yeah, if you needed a bunch or you could sell it to somebody else, that might work well. Um, there's there's a lot of things. When we were looking at thiourea, we can get it pretty damn cheap from China by the container, <laughs> you know? It was pretty pretty inexpensive. If we were a big company... That would make plenty of sense, you know, if we were a big mining company. So see, there's lots of possibilities. We'll just have to see what works. Right now, we have a system that works, not optimized. Um, the dissolving from the ore seems to work pretty well. The recovery from solution seems to work pretty well. The stripping's okay. We think we can do some improvements there. But um, the permitting might be an issue. You know, if you wanted to put in a big mill, they might say, nah, can't do it for whatever reason. It might either cost you a lot of money to uh, satisfy the, the, permit, the permitting organization or they might just not approve it. On the other hand, if, you, if you're using something food grade, it's going to be a lot harder for them to say no. Um, so that it might make sense. And then you got something that, again, assuming there's not a nationwide glycine shortage, you might be able to do just fine. Don't know. And say it's worth checking it out and learning about alternatives. And even then, sometimes, you know, if you're if you're dealing with electronics, one thing may make sense, whereas if you're dealing with ore, something else may make sense. Are you using a high grade or a low grade heap leach? Again, the the conditions determine what is good and what's not. That I would have no idea on, honey bunny. Have no clue. I mean, these are the sort of things you look at. Okay. We got anything else? Looks like I've got some work to do this weekend. Looks like Jimmy has some stuff he can do. We can do for us with him down there in Cardwell. So it looks like we'll get to hit the road for a couple of days. 
and uh, we're getting some other things taken care of. Yep, that's the place. That's the closest uh, town site to where he lives. <laughs> uh, he doesn't live in an actual town site itself. He's out in the, the country. Um, so, but that's the, that's the location. Uh, it's right there on the uh, Jefferson, Jefferson, yeah, Jefferson River. <laughs> uh, well, I I hope I've been helpful, Brian. Um, we try. So I say we'll probably do some stuff there. Uh, I got some some cleaning to do tomorrow. It looks like we're not going to want to uh, leave the truck out at the storage area at this point so we'll uh <laughs> we'll bring it back in when we drop off the trailer i guess we need to move it out wednesday too because thursday we're busy right let's see what's the weather like here pretty sure Uh, Thursday, partly cloudy and 54. Friday, oh, it's getting drier. Now it's Saturday and Sunday is looking at a little snow. So that's good. Tuesday, Wednesday, sunny in the 60s. So yeah, uh, looks like we'll be moving the trailer out on Wednesday will be the plan. Okay. And then Thursday, we, Thursday we have my appointment. take you to... Uh, the appointment, and then frolic on down to Cardwell and get a couple days of work in there. Um, uh-huh. What? Bye, guys, on Thursday. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Now, we're going to be driving the uh, um, Dodge Caravan minivan to Boston. Um, it goes faster. It's got better climate control. It's got cruise control, a radio, and a whole lot less fuel consumption. <laughs> and we're uh, going to, oh yeah, a lot better mileage. Uh, and uh, we're just, we're going to take the um, mattress out of the back of the minor bago and put it in the minivan and cruise that way so it'll be pretty cool plus even i can probably switch out driving to some extent as we as we need to as it should be cool oh, we will be. I like driving. but uh for working in cardwell we're going to need to be able to handle cold temperatures we're going to need some tools this, that, and the other. And it's only, what, maybe 90 miles from here? Yeah. Not very far at all. We sleep in Boston, we don't so, you know, it's it, it makes a lot of sense to, to take bugs for a short trip like this and take the van for a long trip. So that's that's our evil plan. <laughs> oh, all righty. Any other questions? subject or anything at this point and uh as it gets pretty close rock we will uh make some detailed plans but i presume still uh saturday the 13th is a good time to meet up with you correct it's unfortunate we're not going to get to meet your family but oh well okay sounds good we'll probably be calling you like on the 11th as we take out, confirm that we're on the road, everything's going well, and work out details. Anybody got anything else? Uh, any subjects? Anything to 
chat about in particular. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, honey. There you go. Happy prospecting and keep it safe out there, folks. There we go.